This is a J Mix exclusive. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this Tim Brennan for a minute, and uh, let's get into the weeds a little bit about what uh, what was going on with with Tim Brennan. Um, first off, you know uh, I, I don't know if anybody you know, still know who Tim Brennan is, but uh, Tim Brennan worked for Reggie Wright Sr. Okay, he worked for Reggie Wright Sr. on a three man gang detail. And if any of you know how big Compton is, it's an area of ten square miles, and I think at any point in time. There was something like 2,900 or 3,000 gang members on there. So Compton PD and their infinite wisdom created a gang unit that had exactly three people working for it. So that you know that shows you kind of what they what they thought about that. And by the way, how do you get 2,900 gang members to cooperate with three cops? Power, power, and power. All right. Tim Brennan's had a beef with Orlando Anderson since the very beginning, and he let that one out of the bag. Uh, in this next clip that you're about to see. We knew who Orlando was because we had dealt with him on some previous shootings and murder case. Matter of fact, he was with some kids, a couple of South Side Crips. Their way into the gang was to shoot at me and my partner when we went through the McDonald's drive-thru. He had tried to kill you before. That's correct. So Orlando Anderson allegedly took shots at Tim Brennan and Bobby Ladd. Well, I, if somebody shot at me and I was a cop, I probably have a little bit of a grudge against him. And it's ever since that time, Tim Brennan has had his ax to grind with Orlando Anderson. I mean, I'm not making that shit up. Y'all just watched it right there, okay? You saw that that was really what was going on. And so what that did was that put it in his mind that, uh, that uh, Anderson was the bad guy. Now let's jump forward to 1996. You need to understand that Tim Brennan authored and fabricated the gang war narrative. Now, why do we say he fabricated the gang war narrative? Uh, there was no gang war. There was some miscellaneous shootings that went back and forth between the gangs. Compton PD came out and said it really wasn't a gang war. Greg Caden came out and said it really wasn't a gang war. Over the past 20 years, it's come out there was really no such thing as a gang war. There were some tit-for-tat gang shootings that happened in Compton. And originally, they thought they had something to do with the murder of Tupac Shakur. But Compton PD even came out and said that the gang shootings had nothing to do with the murder of Tupac Shakur. So he completely fabricated the Orlando Anderson narrative. Now, uh, I heard Michael say, I think it was in the fifth episode of the uh, A&E show, that David Kenner actually introduced the world to the Orlando Anderson uh, myth. And if you're talking about from a public awareness standpoint, maybe that might be true. But really, it was Tim Brennan who actually introduced Orlando Anderson to the world, because other than the people that were around the beat down, they didn't know who the hell Orlando Anderson was. Tim Brennan authored the entire theory of liability regarding Orlando Anderson. He's the one who tied the beating at the MGM to uh, a shooting that happened and the shooting happened and that they believed Orlando Anderson was the shooter. Now, in this affidavit, okay, there's a bunch of lies. That I don't even know any other way to say it, Jesse. There's just, it's just chock full of lies. Uh, one of the lies that they talk about was they say, that Tupac and Suge were in the first vehicle, okay? They weren't in the first vehicle. They said that somebody got out of the car and started talking shit uh, before they started shooting up the BMW. We know that's not true. They even said that the shooting took place at Las Vegas Boulevard and Flamingo. The shooting didn't take place there. Everybody knows the shooting took place at Flamingo and Koval. And everybody's like, oh, what? What is it? So what? You know, maybe he made a few mistakes. So what? No, the point of the matter is the reason that you put those things in an affidavit for a search warrant is you're trying to sell your narrative to a judge so that they can give you a search warrant to go tear apart some places and do what you want to do. So basically, you have to take and take something that was actually non-existent. And if it was, it was benign uh, and kind of uh, ambiguous and make it personal, make it heated. 
there's a difference. If a, a random arm comes out of a car and shoots somebody, who the hell was that? Who knows? We don't know who it is. It's an arm. We don't. We can't identify an arm. But if somebody got out of the car, stopped the car at that intersection, got out of the car, and started talking back and forth with Tupac and Suge, then that becomes very personal. An arm that comes out a window is very impersonal. But somebody who comes out talking shit, you can't get too much more personal than that. And when you're trying to invent a narrative that says that Orlando Anderson wanted revenge on Tupac, the whole talking shit thing, all of that. But you're a police officer. You're supposed to be a fucking detective. How could you say that the shooting happened at Las Vegas Boulevard in Flamingo? Tim Brennan, nobody made you write that affidavit when you wrote it. You had plenty of time to get your facts right. You have plenty of time to, to make your story right. If you're going to make some shit up, get it right. Get your details right. Because that's what the whole thing is about. They say the devil's in the details. Well, you didn't get your details right. And there were so many things that were wrong with it that, you know, how could you overlook that? So it was just a bullshit fest to begin with. Then he goes into the foot, uh, foot Locker incident. Okay. And I don't even have to explain the Foot Locker incident. Everybody knows that they were in the Foot Locker. Just in case you don't know, Jesse, can you roll the clip where they talk about the Foot Locker? locker incident. How did it get to Tupac? First started when Trevon Lane, who was a Piru gang member, was involved with Death Row Records. Several months later, while they're after the uh, Tyson fight, they're walking through the MGM. Orlando Anderson standing there, and here comes Trevon Lane and Tupac. Trevon Lane points out to Tupac. He whispers in his ear, hey, that's the guy that beat me down, took a Death Row chain. Now, see, they take an original Death Row Records narrative of a chain snatch that the first story was from Death Row Records that it happened that night. We have the documents to prove that that was the first narrative. So to make it even more so personal, after the fabrication of an argument happening at the site, uh, Flamingo and Koval, they jump to this chain story. Now, it's funny that they bring up the chain story in A and E and saying yes, the chain was snatched. Um, because well, that's because they're fucking liars. Okay, and this is what liars do. Liars fucking lie. You know, here's the deal. These guys did this A and E show um, months after, or maybe even months before, when their book came out. Somewhere around the time the book came out. Okay, why don't we show? what they wrote in their book about the Lakewood Mall incident. I can't make this shit up, folks. This is what Tim Brennan said. Tim Brennan said that the necklace was never taken from Trayvon Lane, that there was an altercation and it was snatched off, but it fell to the ground and it was recovered. Okay. Now, didn't they just say, didn't Bobby Ladd in that last clip just say that they took the necklace? Didn't he just say that? You want to roll that back again? Let's roll that clip back again and see if Bobby Ladd didn't just tell them that they stole the necklace. How did it get to Tupac? First started when Trevon Lane, who was a Piru gang member, was involved with Death Row Records. Several months later, while they're after the uh, Tyson fight, they're walking through the MGM. Orlando Anderson's standing there, and here comes Trevon Lane and Tupac. Trevon Lane points out to Tupac. He whispers in his ear, hey, that's the guy that beat me down, took a death row chain. And that is running contradictory to the book, which is up on the screen now. You can see um, it said that the necklace was never taken from him. It fell to the ground and was recovered. He was still in possession of the chain. Now come. And to this the is their book. And Dude, this, this is their fucking book. They wrote this themselves. If you're going to now, it would be one thing. If they had something to say four years ago and they talked about the chain snatch and then they write in the book, oh, well, ha ha, the chain snatch really didn't happen. And which begs the question, what death row chain did they capture at the uh, gang sweep when they found a death row chain at Orlando Anderson's place? What death row chain did they find if the one from Trayvon Lane was never snatched to begin with? But I digress. If they come back and say that, oh, by the way, yeah, every story needed a good plot device. OK. The chain was never snatched. If the chain was never snatched, then how come uh, how would it be a motivation for anything? Why would Trayvon Lane say there's the guy that snatched my chain? He never snatched a chain. OK, so the, the whole thing just crumbles under its own weight to use a phrase from A&E. The whole thing starts to crumble under its own weight. OK, 
He made up the shit about the the uh, the chain snatch. Then tying Tim Brennan and Reggie Wright Jr. together. Reggie Wright Jr. was the one that asked Frank Alexander and Edie I don't mean to go to Vegas and tell that same story about a chain snatch with Tim Brennan admitted never happened. Okay, they asked Frank to repeat the Tim Brennan narrative to Vegas. Okay, that's not enough. Then he gets the affidavit based on all these lies and he goes ahead and he does a gang sweep. He gets the thing now, you know, why don't you play that video of the gang sweep for a minute? Um, yeah, it basically started with Tupac, who is, and Shook Knight, who's with uh, Death Row Records and got affiliates with the mob and moves part of my room. Uh, uh, we have, we received information on who was doing most of these things and there was several uh, bloods involved in we have several Raimi warrants on that, and I don't know if he already covered that. But, uh, it covered pro approximately 10, 10 or 12 incidents in the city of Compton. However, we're looking for evidence to link all these guys with Southside and all the bloods together. And basically, uh, my partner and I will be available if you need anyone identified at any of your locations. And uh, we'll be by the... Uh, by the air, so if you need someone identified at a location, uh, our call sign is George Moore. End of the day, Tim Brennan invented this whole thing. He goes up there, he takes Orlando Anderson in front of Vegas, they don't buy it. So for the last 20 years, this guy's been frustrated, you know, he can't sell his Orlando Anderson did it thing. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, okay. The magic gun appears. You want to talk about the magic gun for a minute, Jesse? Tell us the story of the magic gun. Well, apparently, according to Tim Brennan, um, just so happens that in 1998, when the Compton police uh, was dissolved due to corruption, um, all of a sudden, uh, a gun appears. And he's going through guns. He's back cataloging, back cataloging the guns. And all of a sudden, he notices a gun that is tied to an address that he recognizes and this no, is by the way the this is three thousand guns okay the three thousand guns would basically take up a uh a semi truck okay it would fill pretty much most of a semi truck it's a lot of freaking guns how many guns come in a case generally six ten it's a lot max. of cases 24 max yeah a lot of cases of guns three thousand guns and he finds a gun that he identifies. Now, Jesse, what did they say on the show? How did that gun came to be in Michael Doro's, or I'm um, sorry, in Corey Edwards' backyard? Or his girlfriend's backyard? How, how did it come to be there? Somebody tossed it over the fence? Yeah, so someone, someone just tossed it over the fence. Hmm. The day after Orlando Anderson gets killed, the gun gets tossed over the fence to the dog that nobody wants to go in the backyard to Orlando Anderson's only alibi witness. Hmm. Ben Crump asked, well, it sounds to me like who somebody wanted to set Orlando Anderson up. Who would do that? And of course they cut to commercial. Right? They never answered that question. Well let's let's run one more clip just so everybody can know why. We knew who Orlando was because we had dealt with him on some previous shootings and murder cases. Matter of fact, he was with some kids, a couple South Side Crips. Their way into the gang was to shoot at me and my partner when we went through the McDonald's drive through He had tried to kill you before. That's correct. I know that's a bit choppy for some of the streamers, but uh, in, in the replay it won't be. But there is why. Why would someone want to pin it Orla on Orlando? Well, maybe because they had a bone to pick from an earlier shooting attempt, which they admit to on A&E. So we know about Tim Brennan and his motives are blown in terms of his, his, the bullshit that they go through the thing about a gun. Now they move on to this thing called the Nibin system. Okay. N-I-B-N is how they spelled it on the show, but it's really spelled N-I-B-I-N. Uh, why don't you show the first page of this document here? All right. So that's the Nibin system. This is the one now that everybody's talking about. It's made all the news. 
everybody's going on and on and on, you know, went viral, how the Tupac murder weapon, and I love this, the Tupac murder weapon has disappeared. Well, first off, you can only assume that it might be the Tupac murder weapon because Tim Brennan, which we already just discussed, Tim Brennan, said that they had an ATF agent run it through the Nibin system and it came back a match. They found out the next day, the day when he came back to work, 24 hours later, they found out it was a match. Well, we wanted to talk about that for a little bit because I like to believe that the people that are watching our show are very intelligent people and they actually don't buy the bullshit and that's why they're on the show here. You know, uh, by the way, Carl Artley, welcome to the show. Nicholas Golden, welcome to the show. Dirty Harry Films, Chris DeLotter, uh, Jason Hunter, welcome to the show. King Low, Rice2400, uh, getting a lot of new names. I'm glad. Call your friends. Tell them to jump on the show. We got the real going on here for sure. Um, Terrell's in the house, 313 show. One day I'll get my jacket. Kidding. Shout out to 313. Everybody go sub to Terrell. If you want Detroit's rawest podcast, you want to check out that guy, Rel, from 313. He's got a website, and he's also got a YouTube channel. Please go check him out. He's a solid dude, and he keep, gives it to you raw and unfiltered every single time, and that's why we love him. Right. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, the old P. Frank Williams and all these other uh, Bank Crump and Lolita Files, all these other knuckleheads are on A&E show that really bought into, without doing any checking at all, this alleged document that says that they ran that the Biggie Smalls Task Force ran this gun through the Nibin system and it came up as a match for it. And Greg Caden goes, well, every once in a while you might get a false positive, but it's really rare. Uh, you know, Jesse, let's show this document one more time. Show, show the front page of this document here. Because I want to show you what levels of bullshit these people are going to to try to put something over on you. OK, that's what we're going to do. We're going to call them out. We're going to bust them for the fraud. OK. This thing is a Department of Justice grant study that was done in 2009. This is allegedly a year, two years after this whole Nibin match thing on the gun. And if you notice, there's a study that was done that says it improved the Nibin system by providing examiners the capability to match. Okay, let's go to the second page. In this study, there was a Department of Justice study that was done on the Nibin system. It says that published studies have documented significant false negative errors generated by the Nibin system, okay? And a reduction in false positive candidates over the number of currently selected can reduce the labor burden. And they talk about a labor burden. What does that mean? Well, first off, it means that the Nibin system gets a lot of false positives, okay? A lot of false matches, it's common. This report came out and said it flat out. And you know how long it took me to find this information, guys? Five minutes. I just typed in Niven errors, Niven false positives. I put it in Google. It took me five minutes to blow their whole Niven match thing out of the water. Because first off, Niven is just a computer system that matches images. There's two other things that have to happen for it to be considered a match. And this document talks about it. If you think you might have a match and Niven puts out so many false positives, you still have to have an investigator come in and match those bullet casings together to tell you that it's a match. And that certainly didn't happen overnight. They didn't have any forensic investigator because the casings have to be matched together. In other words, they would have had to have gone and gotten a bullet casing from Vegas. Now, here's the interesting part about that lie. And see if you guys can catch on with this right now, okay? The lie, they said, they put their test-fired gun, the gun that they called the Tupac murder weapon, they put that in Nibis and they said they got a match. Well, the only way they could have gotten a match is if Las Vegas also put the bullet casing into the Nibin system. So if Vegas's bullet casing was already in the Nibin system and they got a match, why would they have any reason to go take the gun to Las Vegas to get it fired? That makes no sense. All they would need from Vegas is a shell casing. That's it. And Greg Kading even made that clear in his book that they had a shell casing. If Vegas was already willing to put the thing into the Niven system, then all the ATF would have had to have done, all Vegas police would have had to have done because they were already committed, is give the ATF, not the LAPD. They wouldn't have given the LAPD the casing. They would have given it to the ATF. That's it. And they would have trusted the ATF because it's not the LAPD. 
and they would have given the, the ATF the shell casing and an examiner, a human being would have put those two together and would have said that those are a match. So at the end of the day, there's no there there. The Niven system is faulty. It's documented to have plenty of false positives. So saying that something came back with a Niven is like saying your clothes are kind of clean. Okay? It's not. Or you're sort of pregnant. Either it's a match or it's not. So why in the hell these clowns at the A&E show keep calling it the Tupac murder weapon and putting it out with TMZ, the other frauds at TMZ that put that shit out, a match in the Niven system does not mean anything. It means nothing without the other steps there. And the first person that told me that was Vince DiPersio, the showrunner at the A&E show, when he was questioning whether or not that document was even legitimate in the first place. And, you know, Jesse, six weeks ago, I sat in this chair and you were right there. And I said that this show is an agenda driven piece that was made by Orange Afro Lady uh and and uh lolita and um it was going to end the way that it ended that it, very little time was going to be spent at the confession letter and they were going to say that orlando anderson did it at the end of the show didn't i say that at the very beginning of this absolutely yeah we we called it from jump let's talk about how they treated orlando anderson okay and and i think to do that i think what we need to do is if we need to out lolita files for who she really is and what her relationship is. So Jesse, why don't we why don't we run that video of uh, uh, how we uh, how we knew uh, or you know how uh, we're good matches? Why don't we run that? Oh well, as soon as we met Lolita, we just looked at each other and knew because right off the bat, she didn't really know what happened in Compton per se, but she knew the hip hop scene and she understood, you know, what we would tell her the stories that we told her. And then she did a, you know, we took her around riding in Compton and we stopped by a house that, a former house that, that uh, we know that was a gang member. And she came inside the house and we talked with the mom and um, we just, we just loved how she acted and, you know, her knowledge of everything. She was perfect for us. She was a perfect fit. Now that was recorded in May of this year long before A&E had ever dropped their first episode. So there it is. I mean, the man behind the curtain, the great Oz is no more than Afro lady herself, who did a business deal with Tim Brennan and Bobby Ladd the jokes on them, because what was supposed to happen is the A&E show was supposed to have come out almost a year ago. And because it was such a cluster of a production at Renegade Productions, and they went through showrunners, they blew their budget, you know, buying wall murals painted by Risky, which is a very nice wall mural, but they painted, you know, paid for a bunch of marketing for the show, and it was, it turned out to be, they just wasted their money. Um, at the end of the day, that book wasn't supposed to come out until after the A&E show was done, and therefore it would have been like, oh, I was so taken with Tim Brennan and Bobby Ladd on the A&E show that I decided I was compelled to write a book with them. That was going to be the bullshit argument that they were going to put out. That book was published April 21st of 2017. Okay. Once upon a kind Compton, Tim Brandon, Rob Ladd, and Lolita Files. Okay. So they dropped the book because they had a contractual a publishing agreement that Tim Brandon and Bobby Ladd wanted the book out. And you know what? And it burned Lolita Files. It showed her for the fraud that she is and how the whole thing from the very beginning was going to be about Orlando Anderson, because why in God's name would she ever do anything to torpedo her own book or the people that she wrote the book with? That makes absolutely no sense. This is a J Mix exclusive. What up, Lashana? 